Okay. Um, All right. So our speaker today is Professor Akbar Said from uh, the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And uh, most everybody here, I'm sure, read at least one of his papers. Absolutely. And we're very interested to in your topic. Some of us here are working on the cognitive stuff. So. Thanks. Uh, Hello, you said it. it's. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's always a good excuse for me to visit New York City. But whenever I'm there, I'm a little sleep deprived, and today is no exception. So hopefully, I'll be coherent. And um, so, yeah. So I'm going to be talking about cognitive communication and time frequency in space. And uh, this is joint work with two of my students. And there's a lot of you know there are people here uh, working on cognitive radio and. <coughs> One of the motivations for it is the way I understand it is that you know spectrum is getting congested. There's a lot of devices, and somehow we want to uh, have these devices sense and adapt to the local wireless environment to more efficiently use the spectrum. And there are many different ways people are looking at it. <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about is a different angle on it. In particular, what kind of capabilities do emerging RF front ends like uh, wideband? transceivers and reconfigurable antenna arrays uh, provide in that uh, space of optimization. And um, so in particular, how we can exploit multipath. So, so the first thing that this talk is really about is multipath, which we know is a salient feature of wireless channels. You have spatially distributed paths, but it's also a fundamental resource in wireless communications. So traditionally, it was considered you know, this nuisance because of fading, but we now know that uh, we can exploit it for many different kinds of diversity, uh, you know, multi-user diversity and delay, Doppler, spatial diversity, and so on. And, um, and so the other thing that this talk is about is uh, what we can do with emerging RF front end. So what, by that, what I mean is we're now looking at transceivers with very large bandwidths, uh, and they have bandwidth and frequency agility, reconfigurable antenna arrays are not quite there, but there's a lot of uh, work being done on where you can change the configuration of antennas on the fly. <clears throat> From a bandwidth perspective, what's happening is that we're getting these really large code lengths in very short durations because you have large signal space dimensions. And overall, they provide very new modes for exploiting multipath. And I'll uh, give a couple of specific examples of that in this talk. And there are several applications in ultra-wideband radio, uh, cognitive radio, and also communication and sensing. Um, but one thing that <coughs> uh, hopefully uh, you'll take away from it is that the theory for really optimizing or designing such transceiver with such front ends is not fully understood. And we don't really understand everything either. It has some uh, ideas that we've been looking at recently. So there's an overview of my talk. So the first thing, uh, it's kind of based on the premise that, you know, unlike the prevalent assumption of rich multipaths um, in wireless, uh, you know, communication analysis and so on, physical arguments and experimental evidence suggest that multipaths are actually sparse, especially when you go to large bandwidths. So first thing I'm going to do is talk about how do we model sparse multipath and it's going to be based on a representation of the wireless channel that my group has been working on for quite some time and it's very simple it's sampling multipath and uh, physical coordinates and it reveals the degrees of freedom that are available for communications so you know what kind of diversity we have available in multiple dimensions and then I'll talk about two cases where we exploit the sparsity of multipath reconfigurable transceivers. And the first example is uh, sparsity and delay Doppler, where you have a single antenna system. And here, the, we'll <coughs> explore this notion of coherence, and we're looking at uh, capacity and reliability in the wideband or low SNR regime. And there's a new learnability versus diversity trade off. And this will become clear later. And then, uh, in the second part, I'm going to talk about how we exploit sparsity in space or angle where we change the configuration of the antenna array as a function of SNR to maximize capacity. Okay, and there will be a new trade-off there, which is optimized in terms of multiplexing gain versus received SNR. Okay, so here's the kind of the idea about this virtual modeling. So on one side, we have statistical models, which are very useful for analysis. So 
the white sense stationary uncoiled scattering model of Bellows from the 60s, and then you know the MIMO IID model by Fuschini and Teletar. Uh, that's on one side. On the other side, a physical model, which are ray tracing models essentially, which try to capture or model the propagation uh, explicitly in terms of different paths. And we are useful for simulations, but not very useful for analysis. And this uh, sample representation of the virtual model is somewhere in the middle, which essentially sample this physical scattering environment uh, at the resolution which is provided by your signal space, uh, you know, which depends on your signal space parameters, and we'll see what it means. And that's what it's, this whole work is based on. And it essentially captures the interaction between the signal space and the physical channel and provides a bridge between the two. Okay, so let's start with a multiple antenna scenario. So, you know, these are here, everyone knows that they've been studied for, uh, you know, in the last decade quite a bit. And the big gain that they uh, offered was a dramatic linear increase with a number of antennas without increasing the transmit power. And so if you think in terms of bandwidth and just think of antennas providing a different dimension, if you look at the capacity formulas, you know, the bandwidth, as you increase bandwidth, the fact that your SNR per hertz is decreasing, your capacity saturates, whereas here, it keeps on increasing forever, at least in principle based on those models. And that's related to this energy capture and the fact that you can create multiple uh, spatial parallel channels uh, in there. But it turns out even this is not quite accurate, so I'll say briefly about it, what happens in realistic channels. So how do we model this channel to really get some idea on what may be happening? So in the multiple antenna channel, you have, say, NT transmitters and our receivers. The channel is described by a, a matrix for coupling the transmitters and receivers. And the original models uh, which were which were led to this linear scaling assumed that these were uh, you know IID Gaussian random variables so it's independent really fading between all pairs of antennas and throughout the talk I'm going to be talking about uh, really scenarios where there's no line of sight per se okay so so that you can put this and that's implicitly based on very rich multipath okay so if we want to look into the physical domain or physical modeling, I'm going to focus on a very simple scenario of uniform linear array of, of antennas. So think about communicating in the horizontal plane and you have a linear array here and maybe a linear array the other side of the room or in some other part of the building. And now we can describe the channel with this using these steering and response vectors, which basically are these n-dimensional vectors which are parameterized by this angle variable which is related to the physical angle through this antenna spacing and wavelength. That's not that important. What is important is there's essentially a spatial sinusoid. And this is the frequency uh, of the phases, you know, how rapidly the phases change. So for broadside communication, theta corresponds to zero. And then when you move to the left or right, it increases in frequency. And it basically says how the phases should be combined at the transmitter receiver to transmit or receive from a particular direction. Okay, so if we, so now we can write, so if we just consider a narrow band MIMO model, we can write it explicitly in a physical model, a ray tracing model, as a superposition of propagation of multiple paths. And each path has an angle of arrival, departure, there's a column vector, there's a row vector, and a complex path gain. And then the combination of these gives you this overall matrix. Uh, and these path gains, we can model different ways. The m mainly the randomness is coming from the phases because they change quite rapidly. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'm not going to assume anything else here right now. We'll see where the Rayleigh fading comes in as well. So this, is, this model is nonlinear in these angles. So the idea of uh, the virtual representation is very simple. That instead of trying to get the actual angle of arrival and so on, which a lot of people's and papers and wireless communication do, I, it's, you know, you, maybe you're interested in that in radar, but not necessarily in communication. So here the idea is that, well, you know, we just sample the scattering environment at fixed directions, okay, because equal to the number of dimensions there are, equal to the number of uh, antennas, and, <coughs> and which corresponds to essentially sampling the far field in uniformly spaced directions in these theta variable. And so we replace this 
propagation of paths into this uh, in terms of these virtual angles or different beam directions which are now fixed in these and now the channel is completely described by this two dimensional kernel or another matrix. Okay, so now this is linear because we have fixed the angles through this simple sampling. Okay, and uh, so it turns out that in this case the two, so the actual antenna domain is related to the virtual beam space through a two dimensional Fourier transform. It's a very simple relationship uh, and it's a unitary transformation. It, I just mentioned that this can be generalized to other array geometries as well, except that these transmit and receive uh, Fourier matrices get replaced by the corresponding transmit and receive matrices of eigenfunctions, where they correspond to the correlation matrices. But I won't say too much more about that. Okay, uh, feel free to stop me if there are any questions. So now let's go one step further. Now suppose that we actually have a wider bandwidth to use and we're communicating over a certain duration and there's actually time variation in the channel. Then now the channel is described by this time varying frequency response matrix. This is a spatial matrix. It's a function of time and frequency. This is a spatial, uh, it's a Fourier transform of the transmit spatial uh, vector and this is the received signal vector. And the, the representation for this matrix is pretty much the same as before except that now we have delays associated with pads and Doppler frequencies uh, associated with each path as well. And you know, this, these layers lead to variation in frequency, Doppler shifts lead to variation in time, and they are within the delay spread and Doppler spread of the channel, which are TM and WD. Okay, so again, you can do the same thing, and you sample it uh, in addition to space, you now sample it in Doppler resolution given by one over your signaling duration and in delay where the resolution is given by one over your bandwidth. Okay, So now we have a looks messy four dimensional uh, representation where we now fix the angles, delays and Doppler shifts at those uniformly sampled positions. Okay, um, so, so you may say well you know it seems like we have made life more complicated but one very useful insight that comes from it, which leads to this notion of uh, sparsity as well, is this partitioning of pads. So here's the basic idea. If you focus on, say, a particular, on the receiver side on a particular beam direction, you basically, that beam is going to be contributed by pads which are center, whose angle of arrival are centered around that direction and within a certain resolution which is related to the beam width or one over the number of antennas. And similarly, if you focus on any particular transmit beam direction, you again are looking at a certain subset of pads which lie within that spatial resolution bin. And <coughs> the main thing is that if you look at the virtual channel matrix coefficient for a particular received beam and a particular transmit beam, it's approximately the, you know, the sum of all the path gains and the paths whose angle of arrival and departures lie in that intersection of those two spatial resolution bends or beam widths. Okay, and uh, <coughs> and these distinct virtual coefficients uh, approximately correspond to a disjoint set of paths. Okay, now you can do the same thing in <coughs> delay and Doppler as well. If you focus on a particular delay, again you have those paths within the delay resolution bin, which is centered around that particular delay and has a with the 1 over W and similarly in Doppler and now if you combine them what you find is that if you look at any particular coefficient corresponding to a particular receive angle, transmit angle, delay, Doppler shift then it's all the path gains which lie in the intersection of that four dimensional uh, or four resolution beams or bends and it's like a hypercube in which it lies. So one thing, and again, these are disjoint, but you can imagine now that you know there's just this multipath, and now we are zooming into it with different dimensions. First, we have two angular dimensions, then delay and Doppler. <coughs> so our partitioning is getting finer and finer, and as we increase the dimensions, at some point, multipath, unless it's really diffuse, will have to give. We'll, we'll be resolving it so finely that you'll start seeing individual paths. And um, okay, so. So the first, now in terms of degrees of freedom, 
Uh, the main thing is that, as I said, there since distinct uh, coefficients correspond to disjoint set of paths, these coefficients are approximately independent because these path gains are independent. And so, in addition, if we model these as Gaussian, or if there are enough paths so that a central limit theorem applies, then they're also approximately statistically independent. And so then the statistics of the channel are completely characterized by the power in these virtual channel coefficients. So you've taken all this correlation and mapped it into these coefficients whose powers or variances essentially characterize the statistics of the really fading channel. And uh, the degree of freedom are kind of uh, imprecisely divide, defined as those coefficients which contribute a dominant amount of power. Okay, some of them are not going to contribute too much power, but there'll be some which are uh, dominant, and those reflect the statistically independent degrees of freedom that the scattering environment offers. Okay, so so here's another way of looking at it. You know, you could have a very low evolution scenario. All the paths you cannot resolve them. This is a perfect scenario for Rayleigh fading. You have a central limit theorem argument. Then you can start splitting them, and you get fewer paths. You can do it even f more, and some places might be. What? Right now, when you start saying, oh, let's split them, we'll draw them. Right, so this could be anything, right? This could be delay. This could be an angle. I can, I can split it in many different ways. So we have four physical ways. So each path has f uh, four physical signatures. One is the angle of arrival, departure, relative delay, and Doppler shift if, if there's motion. And, and uh, implicit is the idea that you'll now build the hardware that, uh, that does this resolution. Well, there it is doing already whether you like it or not. It's like radar systems do it explicitly. Your channel estimation is implicitly doing that in your system. Okay, well, it's like, okay, so the simplest way of thinking about it is rake, rake finger management in CDMA systems. Okay. That's looking at delays. And some delays would not have, say, for example, that much power. So that's one thing which is one very specific example of what is done very explicitly. But even no matter which dimension, and we'll actually look in one domain. Right. So I, I that's sort of what I'm saying. Like somehow when you say, oh, I'm going to look at this by slicing it up in terms of angles, yeah. that you, you, like, it, do, it doesn't, it's not for free. You have to sort of well, design okay. your system that way. Or are you saying, no, no, the physics are just really of the arrival of well, I think, uh, uh, so I don't think you have to, some way of doing it might be more advantageous, but one of the things is that no matter which way you say you look at in an OFDM system, this uh, resolution is happening in the back, and you will see the effect of that in your, you know, frequency response of your OFDM channel, depending on how many paths there are, and we'll see an example of that. Um, but, you know, here, the basic idea is that you, are, you can hit it in many different ways and you start really resolving it finer and finer and then, you know, in a rich multi-path, all of these bins, no matter how fine you zoom in, there's going to be a path. In fact, many of those paths so that it looks like Gaussian, whereas in reality, it's going to look, start looking sparser. They're like some dimensions or some channel coefficients are zero, yeah. Talking as if Doppler and angle of arrival are separate parameters. They are related, absolutely. They're closely related. Absolutely. So, how, so you really don't have these four dimensions of, of parameters independently. Well, actually, so here's um, so if you look at um, so angle, angle and Doppler's definitely are, and but if you but it really depends on whether you have a single bound scattering, or it really depends on the physics. But if you if you start, you know, mixing things around that, you know, there's one scatter there and then it kind of bounces over here, of course, the signal strength is now going to get weaker, then that dependence gets a little weaker. But if I just look at one patch, you're absolutely right. If I go, you know, uh, my Doppler shifts are fastest broadside and they're going to be less if I look away. Well, and, and it, it depends on who's doing the moving. If right. The, if the terminal is moving and nothing else is, then right. all it depends on is the angle of arrival. Right, right, and I think there are dependencies, absolutely, and we can exploit them.
But uh, I'm not actually treating them as independent. In fact, the dependence is coming from the fact that each path has those parameters. And now what you're saying is that, yes, for any given path, depending on the actual physical location, these angle of arrivals and the Doppler shifts are going to be related. And, you know, what it will manifest itself is that when you draw this four-dimensional picture, you'll see those dependencies. I don't have pictures that actually we're doing something in wireless sensing where you see exactly that phenomenon. So I don't think it limits that and uh, there are dependencies which actually further reduce the degrees of freedom. Okay, but the, the one point is that if you had a lot of pads, you will never have holes. You'll keep on seeing channel coefficient, and that's implicit in the IID channel model or the white sense ratio and correlated scattering model. Okay, so one thing is that there are ultimately the degrees of freedom, which are the dominant non-zero coefficients, are limited by the number of resolvable pads. And furthermore, as we increase resolution, we're going to go from Gaussian really to more specular, or I don't even know what to call them, statistics. And, and that's been observed in ultra-wideband measurements, where uh, your wide bandwidth is so large, you're resolving delays so finely that you don't see Gaussian or really statistics. But I'm going to still stick with treating them as Gaussian. Okay, I'm not going to look at that aspect. Uh, but that would be the line of sight aspect. Yeah. But, uh, but if I, yeah, you could see it that way too, I guess. Are these, or Nakagami's, some distribution that's more narrowly uh, compressed than radar? Right, right, so that's true. Right, that is, uh, that's true, but you may still be zero mean, because the phases are going wacko all over the place, right? So you're still going to be zero mean, so it's not, may not be Ricean. But the fact that you don't have enough paths to do a central limit theorem, it will be different than Gaussian. But there could be many possibilities there. That's true. So your view of what you say rich scattering means, no matter how finely you dice this up, you'll see something, a path in everything? Yeah. And in fact, if you look at the models, you know, IID model uh, for multiple antennas, they, they stay IID no matter how many antennas you put in. And if you think about it, you know, for n antenna, there's n squared degrees of freedom. You need n squared pads, and that's a lot of pads. And so, and most of these models, in fact, implicitly have a continuous channel representation, which really means a continuum of pads. And it's, um, yeah. Pardon me. Sparsity depends on the resolution. Absolutely. So one way. So that's what I was gonna. Uh, formally, the way we think about sparsity here is one way is that, or you know, is in terms of scaling perspective, that if you have rich uh, channels, then these degrees of freedom, which are again the dominant non-zero coefficients, uh, scale linearly as you increase the signal space dimensions, which are the product of the two antenna dimensions and the time bandwidth product in this case. Whereas in sparse channels, this growth is going to be sublinear. That's what we, and this is kind of a conjecture, this is the first model that we're looking at. It's, kind of, it's got to be slower than this. How, what particular behavior it'll take, I'm not, I don't know. But one of the things that we've looked at is like a power law behavior where your sparse degrees of freedom, now there's some scaling in space in terms of angles. There's this gamma parameter between zero and one. And then the other one, which is sparsity in delay and Doppler, uh, which is, you know, again, this delta parameter, which says that, as you increase the dimensions, they'll grow sublinearly. Uh, but then in this antenna aspect, we'll lo look at a fixed number of antennas and exploit sparsity as well. But uh, in the time frequency case, I want to look at the scaling behavior. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's look at first this, you know, how can we exploit sparsity in delay Doppler? And here, there'll be a notion of time frequency coherence, and I'll talk about coherent, non-coherent capacity and reliability where we are trying to learn the channel uh, based on simple training-based schema and then looking at the capacity and reliability of that. And we'll see this new trade-off. And this is really the configuration aspect here comes in that, you know, if you look at, uh, in this case, the time bandwidth product is the code length, so to speak. And, uh, you know, in AWGN channels, you can reduce your probability of error by increasing your code length or, you know, keep dropping it down exponentially. And it really doesn't matter how you increase your code length. But here it's like, 
it will it is important it turns out how you increase whether you increase by increasing in time or bandwidth or at what what is the aspect ratio of these packets so to speak how how should they grow in size and it, the way you grow in size impacts the performance so let me give you a little bit, you know some of the work that inspired uh, our work here so one thing which has been known for a while is that the wide, you know, wide band capacity of the fading channel is identical to the AWGN channel, which is essentially the SNR in the wide band limit. But how fast we achieve it uh, can be quite different in uh, the fading channel. So uh, one of the works uh, that uh, you know, Verdu looked at it in 2002, and he defined two key metrics of minimum energy per bit and wide band slope to characterize the wide band limit and basically this is the minimum you bit is the the intercept of this curve and slope is this you know rate of increase as a function of SNR and uh, what we also showed was that you know the our achieving this capacity in fading channels really depends on how much you know the channel at the receiver or channel state information at the receiver in particular if you have perfect channel state information then you know you can achieve uh, first and second order optimality condition with simple schemes like QPSK. On the other hand, when you have no channel state information, then you need these peaky or flashy signals, which have a very high peak to average ratio, to even get first order optimality. And uh, in addition to being impractical, they are not even second order optimum. So, and then of course, uh, uh, you know, Li Yang Yang and you know, Mera and David Che, they looked at this problem and said, well, you know, these are two extremes. You know, maybe perfect CSIR is just too uh, optimistic, and no CSIR is just too pessimistic. Actual channels have some correlation, and we can perhaps learn them. So they propose a model where they said, well, okay, let's assume that the coherent style of the channel actually increases as you uh, reduce the SNR, which will happen as you increase the bandwidth, because this is defined as the total part divided by the bandwidth. And they assume, in particular, that the SNR goes inversely with as uh, coherence time goes inversely with SNR and this mu is this coherence parameter which is bigger than zero but they didn't really say well you know how this might happen and so they showed that under under if this scaling happens then you can actually achieve performance which is between these two extremes so you can bridge the gap so here one of the things we have looked at is that sparsity actually is a natural mechanism for uh, such scaling and coherence and again, you know, if you look at sublinear growth, which is uh, suggested by these ultra wideband measurements, you know, this is one way of looking at this. And so, one of the questions we asked was, you know, how does sparsity impact these fundamental limits? So, so again, this is just a review of the single antenna case. There's, in this case, it's just a single antenna system, and you have a single duration T bandwidth W and you have the sampling and delay and Doppler and this we've already seen and now the two parameters that I want you to notice that there's a parameter delta 1 which reflects the sparsity in Doppler so that the you know the Doppler shifts are less than the maximum resolvable ones and similarly delta 2 is the sparsity in delay that the actual growth in delay resolvable delay is actually slower than the maximum number of resolvable delays and so again, which would be all of these bins, delayed Doppler bins would be filled up, whereas in sparse channels, they'll start showing holes. So um, now, so this is related to uh, Roy's question earlier. The way we can exploit it is actually in a time, this is like a short time Fourier domain, which is a generalization of OFDM. And the idea is that you tile your time frequency plane or your duration and bandwidth with these basis function which are have a certain duration and time and a certain bandwidth and the number of basis function is exactly equal to the time bandwidth product so it's a complete orthogonal basis sometimes they're called Gabor bases and the important thing is that they sell as approximate eigenfunctions for time varying underspread channels okay so this is work that uh, uh, we did a few years ago and so in this case <coughs> it turns out that there's a very nice interpretation, or it's a simplified interpretation of uh, coherence in time and frequency, where you can split this uh, total dimension into 
D times the coherence dimension N C, where D is exactly the delayed Doppler diversity in the channel. So you can think of it as splitting this into D coherent subspaces, which each subspace has N C elements, and which coefficients are nearly very strongly correlated within each subspace, and then they are uh, getting decorrelated across different subspaces. It's like a block fitting model, but it's capturing the degrees of freedom, underlying degrees of freedom, that the independent coherent subspaces are precisely equal to the delayed Doppler diversity. Okay? Now, in rich channels, as you increase the dimensions, these coherent subspaces increase linearly with uh, the dimension, whereas the number of, uh, the dimension of each subspace remains fixed. Whereas in sparse channels, both of them are going to grow sublinearly. Okay, and in fact, the fact that this coherent subspace in dimension increases allows you to learn the channel. Okay, um, so here delayed upper diversity manifests itself as this time frequency coherence. And so, if we represent our system with respect to this basis, then this is a system equation, and H is now going to be we're going to assume it to be perfectly diagonal, even though it's going to be approximately diagonal. And then it has this block diagonal structure consistent with this coherent subspace interpretation. And these, so now there are D coefficients that we really, which really characterize the channel, and they are IID, zero mean, unit variance, Gaussian random variables. And uh, them being IID is not unreasonable because it turns out that if you look at it, the statistics in time and frequency are actually stationary, which all of also follows from Bellow's earlier work. So these D, when you don't know, when you have perfect CSI, this is the delayed Doppler diversity. When you have no channel, uh, channel state information of the receiver, this is the uncertainty in the channel. Okay? And again, as I said, sublinear growth in D in sparse channels. So, so we are going to look at, so I'm going to give results on both capacity and reliability, and the important thing is that it all, they only depend on this coherence dimension NC and the SNR, which is P, the total power divided by the bandwidth. And one thing to note is that NC in our sparse model naturally scales with time and bandwidth. Okay, so it's based on these parameters. Now, if you increase bandwidth, your coherence dimension is naturally scaling. Now, if we couple it with the, this SNR relationship, we can get a similar relationship between coherence dimension and signal-to-noise ratio with this coherence parameter mu, analogous to what uh, Yang and Say and Mehrad had done. And what this says is that these two combines say that for any level of operational coherence mu that I want, I can choose time as a function of, or signaling duration as a function of bandwidth and other channel parameters and the sparsity parameters to achieve that. Okay, and uh, this this relationship we'll revisit again because that's key in terms of this aspect ratio configuration. What NC? is the dimension, coherence dimension. So it's basically the dimension of that coherent subspace. So it's the total dimensions uh, TW, which is a time bandwidth product, divided by the degrees of freedom. Okay. So yeah, it's kind of a, a lot of parameters in there. But again, the important thing to remember is that it's going to grow at a sublinear rate <coughs> as you increase time and bandwidth. Okay, so uh, and we're going to look at a training-based scheme. And again, in this case, it's a very simple. Since all the channel coefficients in each coherent subspace are identical, we train by communicating over one dimension, communicate, and then communicate data over the remaining dimension in each coherent subspace. And the lower D coefficients we need to estimate, and uh, and here's you know one of the parameters which we optimize the fraction of energy that we you know consume for training, which can be written in terms of again N C and S N R, and the mean square error we use a very simple uh, linear M M S C receiver in here, which is relevant for this Gaussian channel. Mean square error is given by one over one plus the training energy. Yeah, so the prior information about the channel is this how many degrees of freedom there are. So you have some, so here that's a good question that I am assuming that there's statistical CSI at the transmitter where it says, well, the degree of freedom, the dominant coefficients are D, which is related to how many signal space dimensions there are. Okay. 
and then once that, and then of course this is block fitting. Actually, the channel is not going to be block fitting model. Well, this is for analysis, but it is it preserves the degrees of freedom, or the dimensionally uh, it preserves how many degrees of freedom there are. Any other questions? So how, how is that practically you just uh, over certain bandwidth you communicate, and over certain time you communicate within that particular block? Right. So that's yeah. So what you're doing is actually you're modulating on all these basis functions. So the transmitter you modulate onto these basis functions. Now, so remember, now you are actually communicating over the entire. So first, you you know represent that whole signal duration and the bandwidth with these basis functions. You modulate at the transmitter with that. And what happens is that each one of these is one of the basis functions. So here you put a training symbol, and the remaining are are the data symbols. And at the receiver, you estimate this, and you get the channel coefficient, and then you de decode the rest. Okay. So the first thing related to sparsity is that sparse channels are asymptotically coherent. And what that means is that in the limit of large signal space dimension, it turns out that the mean squared error and the fraction of optimized fraction of energy, and this is optimized from the point of view of maximizing capacity or reliability, goes to zero if the coherence dimension scales <coughs> with SNR and mu is bigger than one. Okay? And so you know, what it's saying is that we can learn these channels asymptotically perfectly and by using vanishingly, vanishing fraction of energy in the limit. Whereas for rich channels, you can't do it. Okay? And of course, you have to scale TNW the right way uh, in terms of the earlier relationship, but we'll revisit that. So, so that's the first <coughs> condition that, you know, they are perfectly learnable, so we can bridge the gap. Now, here is the result on the mutual information of the training based scheme. So if you look at the low SNR uh, and a wide band or, or low SNR limit of the capacity, it has these two terms in the Taylor series. One is the SNR and the second one is the SNR squared term. And, and if you know perfectly, if the, ch if the channel is known perfectly at the receiver, it takes these forms. So the coefficients are one and the other, the second order term is what can be problematic. So it turns out that this, for this training based scheme, its mutual information satisfied this relationship where the second order term is 1 plus epsilon and if and only if the coherence dimension scales with mu which is bigger than 1 plus 2 epsilon. So in particular if you wanted first order optimality which essentially corresponds to this first term you need mu bigger than 1 and if you want second order optimality you need mu bigger than 3. And actually yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the easiest way to think about it that way, yes. So let me see if I can. Uh, it's earlier, maybe. Uh, maybe here might be. No, not this one. This one. So here is, you know, NC is related to time bandwidth and these parameters this way based on the sparsity parameters so it naturally scales. Now if you plug in W as SNR, you know, P is just a constant, uh, W as 1 over SNR, then you can get this relationship between NC and SNR as long as T and W are related through this mu parameter. So this mu is a, uh, it turns out, I mean this is kind of a little bit reverse engineering, it turns out that all this, all the capacity or reliability analysis only depends on NC and SNR. And these two coupled relate them through the signal space parameters. And I think as we go on, it might become a little bit more clear. But it's basically this and this relationship combined which gives you this, yeah. Maybe I didn't understand something. So when you are using these STF basis functions, yeah. so whatever results you have are in the space of those basis functions. Right. So that TW basis is, so how is the result different from, so if I just had a OFDM system with TW functions, because you are doing everything in the space of the basis functions. Right. So once you go, go to that space, how are the results different? They're no different. So uh, if with OFDM, what will happen is that your time variation is going to start killing you as you increase your block length too much, right? So that's why short time Fourier basis functions are needed. Yeah, I know that, but after you have gone to the yeah. space of the basis functions, yeah. it should be same, right? Or yeah, right. It's, it's, it's in some ways... In the, the resulting 
if you account for, you know, the model, the modeling won't be as easy in the case of OFDM, but you should be able to do it in the case of OFDM as well, but you might have to do a lot more work. So modulation can make life easier, but you're right. I mean, in terms of capturing the channel statistics, you know, either on OFDM. Yeah. Right, it was. Right, it doesn't matter. But. Yeah, so, so, so what will happen is that in a short time Fourier basis function, this is not going to be diagonal. I mean, in, in the case of a OFDM, it's going to be block diagonal. There's going to be interference between different uh, frequencies. If you have Doppler and you look long enough, absolutely there will be. Um, there is no getting around that. Any other questions? Um, yeah, this is counter dude. Not that many people. This is my from my PhD work, time frequency stuff. So um, it uh, yeah. So anyway, let's. Uh, so we get to this, and what it's saying is that in order to get first order optimality, we need mu bigger than one, and second second order optimality mu bigger than three. Yeah, so I'm getting to that in a second. So this is, this is, uh, this, mu, think of it as the level of coherence. So the larger the value of mu, the faster NC scales gets large, grows as you decrease SNR. So mu reflects how much, so larger mu is the channel is more coherent. So for first order optimality, you don't need too much coherence. For second order optimality, you need a lot more. And this was exactly the same conditions as, uh, uh, you know, Jiang and Sei had assumed on the coherence time. One difference now, one new thing here is that we have the coherence costs are shared in time and frequency. So, if you uh, so effectively the coherence time requirements are reduced. That's one way of looking at it. But a more important way is that any desired level of coherence can be achieved. Where there, you know, in that case, we have to assume somehow the channel is coherent. But in sparse channels, you can just achieve. You choose, give me any mu, and I can make w and t large enough so that I can achieve it, and I can scale them at the right way. And this is like a canonical relationship between the signal space parameters and the channel parameters. Or conversely, if you give me any choice of parameters, I can tell you the effective level of coherence at which you're operating at. Okay, so now if I wanted to, so now you can see I want one. I can scale things appropriately so that my mu effective is bigger than one and or three. And here's another picture of the asymptotic coherence. This is basically the constant. So we hadn't quite nailed down the order. There was a, if you remember, there was an order relationship up front. We hadn't quite nailed down, and we haven't nailed down the constant, the second constant analytically. But for for our numerical results, what we see is that you know you've, as you increase signaling durations, in this case we're just increasing t. You know, the first coefficient, which is the first constant, actually converges to what it should be, and then later the second coefficient also converges. So it seems to be getting the coherence conditions. But notice that these are quite crazy signaling durations. So uh, this is kind of 10 to the 10th. Yeah. So that's a very long time duration. So, but some of these can, these, these are really ridiculous. This is like, you know, after you're dead, oh, 10. <laughs> 10 universe lifetimes or something. But no, the constants can affect things. 10 to the 5 is a year. Seconds. Yeah, 86. So these are really long codes. No, wait, is that a day? 10 to the 5. 86. That's a day. Yeah, yeah. It's a day. 24 times 60 times 6. 10 to the 5 is a day? Well, that's not too bad. Coding over a day? No, I'm just kidding. So to the 5 days. You shouldn't be taking these numbers quite literally because if here we have an account for constants, these can be much smaller. But still, this normal optimality, yeah, it might take forever. So in that regard, it's really a, an academic uh, result. But I think uh, one of the things where you can use peaky signals to actually reduce it, um, this time requirement. But And if we include constants, these numbers are not quite as crazy as uh, these. But they, they nevertheless suggest a trend. Yeah. Both bandwidth, so first of all, bandwidth is large, and now we are increasing both 
so this is for a fixed bandwidth. If I'm just increasing time, the signaling duration, then I'm achieving the both, you know, I'm effectively increasing this mu, okay? And what it's showing is that you actually get the optimal coefficient of the two terms in the uh, important term in the Taylor series as you increase t because here it's like effectively saying mu is bigger than 1, here mu is bigger than 3 yeah, by increasing. Time bandwidth is 10 to the minus 6. No, that's the channel spread factor. So bandwidth in this case is 1 gigahertz and then this is on top of it very large. So yeah, so these are. That's the act. The true numbers are very meaningless, but I will. The but as I said, in this case, we haven't even put all the constants. But I'll I'll tell you what it means a little bit more in terms of what it what it really means. So does this mean that uh, as you increase time and bandwidth, yeah. you're tending to an IID channel? No. no, no, no. You actually are turning more and more coherent. Yes. Oh, okay. You are actually going away from that. And, and if you think about it, the degrees of freedom per dimension are going to zero. So, you know, your diversity per se is getting smaller in diversity per degree of freedom, but you know, it doesn't, that doesn't affect coherent capacity. Um, but in uh, reliability, it will come into play and maybe this will be even clearer when we uh, view this way. Now we'll see the trade-off in a different way. So that was capacity, achieving uh, capacity in a non-coherent scenario with a training-based scheme. Now we want to look at how reliable, how does reliability of the scheme is affected by this choice of signaling parameters. And again, this is to be looking at the training based scheme. And so the reliability, you know, basically the probability of error we know decays exponentially with the block length, which in this case is a time bandwidth product. And reliability function, this was introduced by Gallagher, is, you know, basically the slope, a limiting value of this rate at which the probability of error decays. Now, there are well-known bounds, the lower bound is the random coding bound, the packing bound, and we're going to focus on the lower bound because it gives us an upper bound on the probability of error. Now, you know, this error exponents are really nasty to work with, and in very few cases you can solve. In many problems, this finding the optimum Q is a big problem, so here we are assuming it to be IID Gaussian following some other work as well, which is not optimum. And then there's an additional optimization over this parameter rho. So, but it turns out in our block fitting model, life is a little bit easier. So we can post some of the analysis, and then we have to look at things numerically. But again, what we see is that this error exponent is a function of NC and SNR only. So, again, we're looking at the training based scheme. We optimize the fraction of energy for training, which turns out is the same for optimizing capacity or error exponent turns out to be the same thing, which is a curious uh, fact. And then we look at the lower bound. And uh, here's the main thing that comes in this analysis, and that is um, that, hmm, is it 230? Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, so here's, a, here's the main thing that's coming here. There's a channel uncertainty versus diversity trade-off. and. Uh, what it says is that uh, for any rate between uh, b below capacity, there's an optimum level of coherence, which is again that parameter mu in the SNR, which maximizes the error exponent. Okay, and if mu is less than this optimum value, then it's an <coughs> then we're in a learnability limited regime, or there's too little coherence. We haven't worked hard enough to make it coherent. And if it's bigger than that, then you're in a diversity limited regime. You've worked too much to learn the channel, and you've messed up. And uh, again, there's an operating point as a function of this transmission rate, and also uh, the code length implicitly. But asymptotically, it'll vanish, of course, dependence on code length. And again, you can achieve any of these operating optimal operating point by through this relationship. So here's um, quick yeah. So there are two things there. There's a channel that comes with its own coherence, yeah. and something which we may not be able to fundamentally go to because of some other <coughs> constraints on yeah. you know transmission and so on. And then then you're saying there's a 
constrained from just how much you're learning, how much time and bandwidth you can use mm -hmm. to learn the channel? Is that, is that well, what, it's, what I'm really, that's a good question too. I mean, what is the relationship with the actual coherence of the channel and what you... So do? actual coherence of the channel, how do you define it? So what I'm saying here is that the actual coherence of the channel changes when you change your bandwidth. That's it's sort like of the, the Heisenberg in No, it's like the fundamental principle of wireless. You create the channel depending on what you transfer. There you go. Well, um, you should have been here earlier, so I'll be preaching to the yeah, choir. You know, here's the thing. I walk in an hour late. I'm really sorry. Well, that's okay. I still haven't figured out what your talk is about. Though. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying, trying to figure things. it out, too. So, I'll ask you at the end Okay. But no, but I think that the, the real, yeah, that, no, that's okay. The real thing, the real message, and this is a very good question, is that the channel is actually changing as we increase our bandwidth and signaling duration. And so, so the coherence is changing. So it's becoming more and more and more and more coherent. So learning it becomes easier. And in this case... Uh, but suppose you had an IID channel. Right. You can't say... You cannot do that. No, exactly. That's why I'm saying IID channels are a myth. No, but then you're assuming something implicitly about this channel, right? Right, sparsity. That the degrees of freedom are scaling sublinearly. IID channels will grow linearly and you cannot do any of this. Absolutely true. But ID, ID channels are not real. I, that's, yeah, that's one message from this talk too. We've been, yeah. Okay. So, so here's, here's another way, here's a picture of the error exponent. So this is the normalized rate. And this is normalized error exponent because error exponent is also a measure of capacity as well. Uh, so what it's showing is that in any, you know, as you, and these are the curves for different values of mu, which I can choose by, you know, through this relationship, by choosing t as a function of w appropriately. And what you find is that, you know, first of all, remember, mu equals 1 was for first order optimality. Here we can only get a fraction of the rate in terms of error exponents. So clearly, we need more than this to go closer. And here, notice with mu equals 2, we can get almost close to the coherent capacity, but I, uh, we haven't quite narrowed it down. I think it's going to need at least three if our coherent capacity analysis is true to be able to get to normalized rates close to one. But the important thing is that at any rate, there is an, a curve that is just, you know, tangential real optimum. And in this case, the value of mu is between 1.1 and 1.2. And anything below it, you're going to be in the learnability re regime that you know you're not you don't have enough coherence anything above it you're working too hard to uh, you know making coherence too much okay and here's the i think this is probably i like the best way of thinking in this picture what what it's showing is that this is bandwidth this is signaling duration and it's showing the locus of points uh, where the error exponent is maximized so for very sparse channels, it goes like this, that you know, your, your, your signaling duration doesn't quite have to grow as <coughs> fast. So it's these, pa you know, these packets in time and frequency look more like tall packets. And now in time and wide in bandwidth. And this is how you grow them as you increase the code length. Medium sparsity, they kind of go at the same rate. So it's like maybe square packets. And, and when your channel gets um, less sparse or close to rich, then it's saying, you know, you just keep on increasing time and you get, you know, your the usual results in terms of increasing your code length. And uh, so, you know, and if you look at this, if you look at AWGN channels, there's, it doesn't really matter. You can increase your code length and bandwidth or time, it won't affect your error exponent. But here, it's saying that it does matter. And you're going to pay a price quite sharply if you deviate away from this. So it's saying that's the optimal locus on which you should go so, so to drive. So with sparsity definition, right? Yeah. So what is a narrow band, your typical sort of rally fading channel? So well, that's rich, sufficiently rich. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's only when you increase your, when you start resolving multipath, you're breaking it apart that you'll start seeing the sparse behavior. So given a channel, can you find where exactly we are, where the data is? Yeah, that's a good. Sorry, you, one more. Yeah. So is less sparse the same as rich? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, it should be richer. Uh, that's a very good question. So I think the way I would do it is, uh, uh, you know, I'd estimate the coefficients, say, uh, you know, the delay Doppler coefficients, and see how many dominant ones there are, and then try to 
C, you know, D, the ratio of D over W or in, in the two dimensions. We haven't really thought through about that, but I think that's uh, directly related to channel estimation and basically just estimating the statistics. Right, right, right. And that, and those are just based on channel statistics. So that's statistical CSI, which is telling you the level of sparsity. So, so information theoretically always used to get code length as time usage. Right. Or anything. Right? No, so anything. Channel users. You could be. Right, right. You use a narrow band and you use a lot of time, so you see. No, well, actually, it's not saying narrow band. You could do it that way, but it, what it's saying is that another way of thinking about it is that the two uh, ways of increasing the code length are independent. You can in interpret this as a joint PDF. And what it's saying is that when the channel is completely rich or super sparse, because super sparse is really AWGN, and rich is like there's no sparsity, it's saying in those scenarios, you can increase your code length anyway and it'll be fine. It doesn't matter. But in sparse channels, it does matter how you scale, how you make your packet, how you get your code length, how do you increase your code length. So yeah, traditionally, in, in, in traditional information theoretic analysis, it doesn't come into play at all. So this is exactly where the channel itself is changing because, you know, the channel doesn't change that PY given X is not a function of block length. So what this is saying is that your channel, that conditional density of output given input is a function of code length. So it's a little wacky. So uh, AWGN lies in the blue? AWGN, I think that this is still bothering to me that, you know, one case I get independent this way. I think AWGN lies, this is really the AWGN one. And this is the IID. Right. No, it should be that it's saying that time and bandwidth should be uncorrelated. So if you think of a PDF, you know, it should be on this axis or that axis. Whenever it's somewhere in the middle, they are correlated. You have to. Yeah, roughly the same rate you're increasing both, yeah. The, and that's like smack in the middle, 0.5. And uh, that, I think that's also an interesting operating point, square root. So AWGN we're agreeing is uh, higher than extremely uncorrelated, independent, but extremely identical channels. They are extremely identical. The only source of uncertainty is noise then. Extremely sparse channel is uh, highly correlated, like one path, and you, uh, you can estimate the hell out of it. Sounds like AWGN. It is AWGN, really. It is. That's what I'm saying, that extremely sparse is AWGN, whereas rich is and in both cases, it doesn't matter how you increase your code length. So you said it doesn't matter, so this uh, red can be uh, sleeping yeah, and Yeah, basically what it's saying is that what, it, it's basically saying that its dependence is going away. It, it's not saying that you can get the capacity in, well, you, it can if you keep on increasing bandwidth and code over frequency. And in this case, it's basically saying that, you know, you can, and I think that might be the way we are plotting it too. It, you know, these two roles might be flipped as well. I'm not sure about that. Um, but both those are extremes, it doesn't matter. Any other questions? Okay, so now you switch gears and go to multiple antennas. So here it would be a little more tangible and accessible. Uh, and tangible, because uh, this one is a little, I, we still don't fully understand what all those results mean. Uh, but here, so here the idea is that we're going to maximize the capacity. Why, why? I think I'm going way over time. So. Okay, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah, I can wrap it up in 10 minutes. Uh, so here, maximizing capacity is reconfigure arrays, and uh, we'll see a new trade-off here as well. Okay, so here we again seen this, so maybe, you know, you have the physical model, you sample it, and now 
the dominant virtual spatial coefficients of the entries of this matrix are what are the degrees of freedom and again they are limited by the number of paths and I have already talked about this that you know in this case uh, in the rich scenario the degrees of freedom are always n d times n r which is the size of the matrix there are always that many independent entries and in sparse case it is going to be some sublinear growth in the product of the transmitter received dimensions. Uh, so, in terms of scaling, so suppose your transmitter and receiver antennas are equal. So, our IID channel results said that you know capacity scales linearly, and then people looked at correlated channels and they said, well, it still grows linearly, but the slope is smaller. Okay, but the one thing which was common between both of them was that they use the same energy normalization, the channel power normalization, and that is the part where things. Uh, get lost. So, in an earlier paper, we showed that you know you cannot really guarantee it requires order n squared growth in paths to achieve uh, this linear scaling, and it may not always be possible. And now, more recently, we have uh, made it precise that if your degrees of freedom scale, you know, at some rate n to the gamma, then your capacity can at best scale as square root of that degrees of freedom. So, n gamma over 2. So, if gamma was 2 which is a IID channels you get the linear scaling, but if it is anything below that then square root of that degrees of freedom is what you can best scale at. Okay? But what we are what we are looking at here is for fixed antennas and what can we do as a function of SNR and that was a natural byproduct of this work. So, gamma? yeah. Why is it 2 for IID? Well, n squared, like think about an IID n by n matrix, n squared entries. And so, if you think about virtual representation, that is at least that many paths you need to excite those coefficients. Okay, so, so this is the, you know, so in this case, we are assuming that channel is perfectly known at the receiver, coherent scenario, and we have the statistical information that how many degrees of freedom there are. And so, the capacity most of you have seen this formula log debt and you know this Q is the input covariance matrix and it turns out that in this beam space this R input covariance matrix is diagonal even if it is a correlated channel and so that makes it easier and so you can send independent signals a Gaussian signal in different beam directions to achieve capacity. But one important thing which kind of motivated this work for us. Uh, is that you know in IID channels it is known that equal power IID input is optimal at all SNRs. So, you just put equal power in all beam directions. Whereas, in correlated channels <coughs> uniform power input is only optimal at high SNRs and at low SNRs it turns out that you focus all the power in the direction which has the strongest power coupling to the receiver. So, this is the power you know this is 5 by 4 by 4 virtual channel matrix it is power it is powers and this is the sum of the powers so it is the marginal of that and what it is showing is that at high SNR you will excite all channels but at low SNRs you will just excite this strongest channel. So, you lose your multiplexing gain and more importantly you lose all this channel power that was in the scattering environment and at low SNR that can be significant. So, this reconfigurable antenna array is it precisely gets around this inefficient throwing away of power. So, sparse channels here is the picture in IID you know in rich channels all of these this is n by n channel just consider it n by n matrix there could be n there will be n squared entries for IID channel but in sparse channel they are less d. Now, so one automatic question is that you how would you distribute these degrees of freedom in these bins to maximize your capacity. So, that is what we define the you know optimum configuration. So, that is like saying ok I have you know optimize all possible such uh, channels in which and in this case we are assuming that they are either 0 or uh, unit variance. So, how do you distribute them? So, it is uh, in general is you know uh, there, may, there could be many solutions, but we came up with one constructive way in which we can characterize this optimum configuration. So, consider just the case where you have 
an n by n channel where there are n squared possible degrees of freedom, but you only have n paths, dominant paths, or n available degrees of freedom. Then <coughs> we split this D into P and Q, where P is a number of parallel channels, or multiplexing gain, and Q is the degrees of freedom per parallel channel. Okay, so in one case, what we can do is, one extreme is what we call beam forming, that you put all those in one column. Okay, so you have one parallel channel, rank one, and the receiver sees all those dimensions. The other extreme is this multiplexing channel where you put them on the diagonal, so you excite all parallel channels, but there's only one degree of freedom per parallel channel. So in this case, there's a lot more received diversity, so to speak. Here, there's no uh, diversity with each parallel channel. And this is called ideal uh, configuration where you, you know, shrink it and make it into a smaller IID channel, square root n by square root n. You have n entries, now you make it into square root n by square root n IID channel. And so in this case, you know, multiplexing gain is increasing this way. It turns out receive SNR is increasing this way. So what we showed is that, well, you can also define it for different gammas or values of D. But what we showed is that the capacity, if you partition it this way, for all these uh, channels takes this very simple formula, reminiscent of uh, Shannon formula, and it's accurate in the lower high SNR regime. It's approximate in the medium SNR regime, but you know, in the medium SNR regime is always a tricky one. But the interesting thing is here. This is this is our multiplexing channel, which gives us the highest capacity at high SNR, whereas it loses multiplexing gain at low SNR. And this is the AWGN curve, which is essentially single antenna capacity curve. This is the beam forming configuration, which gives you the maximum multiplexing gain at low SNRs, but loses it at high SNRs. And this one is a robust configuration, which straddles the two extremes. So it's like a piece of a Mobius paper here. And this actually configuration is the one which achieves the highest, you know, fastest capacity scaling, incidentally. So, so this is fine and good, but you may say, well, now how the hell are we going to control this scattering environment in practice? And that's where the array configurations come in. But before I, I just um, say that we can characterize these points, and another important thing is that for all practical purposes, these three configurations could give you near optimum performance. At every SNR, there's an optimum value of P, which gives you the highest capacity, but you can basically, for all SNRs, below a certain point, you can use the beam forming configuration, ideal in the middle, and multiplexing on the right. So three configurations are good enough. But how do we realize it? But that's where the configuration comes in. So for multiplexing, the configuration is you have the maximum antenna spacing, say lambda over 2, which depends on the angular spreads. And in this case, you have the number of beams is equal to the number of antennas, and the beam width is 1 over n, which is the resolution. The ideal channel corresponds to this square root uh, spacing where you take the original maximum spacing, reduce it by square root n. Now what you have is you have square root n beams, but each one of them has a wider beam width. And in fact, there are square root n antennas coherently contributing to each beam. That's actually very critical. And the beam width, as I said, is wider. And then in the beam forming configuration, you have really closely spaced antennas which have a really wide beam, and uh, there's one beam, and its beam width is one, so it has the highest beam width, and all of them are coherently contributing to this one beam. Now, so here's what the actual, so this is, so this is now, I'm actually, these are results from an actual simulation where I've randomly put these pads, uh, N pads, 25 pass in this 25 or 25 channel. And this is representation of that multiplexing regime, even though it's not diagonal, but there's effectively one degree of freedom per parallel channel. So that's the maximum resolution. Then uh, here's the ideal channel. So I'm literally looking at the same scattering environment, and I changed the antenna spacing, and I looked at the virtual channel matrix and its powers, and it literally squeezes it. It's like a lensing going on in there and as we expected it. And then if you consider, and what is happening is that this whole bin is getting coherently mapped into one pixel there. And if we look at this configuration where you reduce the antenna spacing at the transmitter and leave the maximum of the receiver, then the channel looks like this one column which we expected.
and your capacity uh, is actually, you know, this is a simulated capacity, so they actually match the actual capacities quite well. And so, you know, going back to what I said, you know, not throwing away the channel power, what it's doing is that, and the multiplexing channel is, the channel is full rank and your input is full rank. But then as you go to medium SNRs, instead of throwing away power in some dimensions, you actually shape the channel so that your, you know, your input has now a smaller rank, as we expect, but now the channel has the same rank. So it's like a source channel matching. And then at low SNRs, you have a rank one input and a rank one channel, and you don't throw away any channel power. And that's what gives you those uh, capacity gains. So basically it's saying that if you want to guarantee the multiplexing gain over all SNRs, then you cannot achieve it with a fixed configuration. You have to reconfigure your uh, MIMO system. But does the low SNR beamforming configuration implies that the CSI of the transmitter? No. So, so this this is completely statistical CSI. The only thing here here, pardon me, statistics. So basically, but there is one assumption here that the sparse paths are randomly distributed. So you know they might be clustered, but we can do tricks for that too. But if your sparse uh, coefficients are randomly distributed in the scattering environment, and you know how many dominant coefficients they are, which you can do simply by estimating the power in the virtual channel matrix, then this basically says, as a function of SNR, what should be my spacing? And we can actually quantify that as a function of SNR. So it's no CSI as a transmitter. It's by the spacing is what's doing the trick. So why do you call it ideal case ideal? Ideal case ideal because that gives you the fastest capacity scaling. So in fact, we I was even calling this ideal from a fixed endpoint calling that ideal to make it really confusing. So I started using different, but that, that's the one which achieves the fastest capacity scaling, actually. So, so I'll just, I have a concluding slide here, and I think pictures uh, say it all. I think one message to take away is that, you know, ID channels are not are unreal. And, and as you increase the dimensions, bandwidth, and number of antennas, you're going to see sparse channels. And one way of thinking about it is that the degrees of freedom uh, in the channel grow sublinearly with uh, the signal space dimensions. And then we can do, we can learn the channel better. So this was the error exponent stuff. So your packet configuration and array configurations. Um, but one, so you know, agile, our front ends are allowing us to do many of these things. And some of them are, you know, reconfigurable antenna arrays like this are not practical right now, but there are many other possibilities uh, there, uh, but one aspect is that you know it, this is just new. I, I mean, I think really we need to understand it better how we can exploit these devices uh, better. So In particular, well, where you can change the bandwidth, uh, and some of it might be possible in software. But uh, you know where you, you have frequency agile, you can change your frequency of operation and the bandwidth of operation or modulation format as well. And in this case, you know, we were actually communicating over the entire, coding over the entire bandwidth. And, uh, and with the configurable antenna arrays, uh, we didn't do that. That was just the capacity stuff. So, um, and, and one aspect which I think is some of these, at least the wideband stuff is getting to is this finite energy is a very tough problem, but, uh, um, you know, in, in a Shannon stuff is finite power, infinite energy implicitly because the code lengths are infinite. But what are really the limits when you have a finite energy and you can use as much bandwidth or uh, you know as many uh, as large a code length as possible? What are the limits? Um, that's a very hard question, but I think these may be giving some insight. And then there are a lot of connections with radar and sensing. Uh, and this is one component which could be explored in cognitive networks. So I'll stop there and, and take any other.